Chelsea's Thai Engel. As a journalist, I prefer to be on the ground, in the field, where the action is really happening. That is not Iran. No. That is not Khomeini. No. That's the people looking for freedom. There's a sniper out here somewhere. He's hit three people. Two headshots and uh, a chest. There is. <laughs> يعني انزان من داعش تشي او جي انسان او كارو شربك يا اجي كارو شربك مسلاحي وهي مسلاحي مجي هيا اما دالي كديدا فكري مجي ويخور ترا يعني بخوازي دس دين سر تشتا تشتا شخورة بوبين قطعت رأس كم شخص؟ في مقارب الشابين وقت As an Israeli journalist most of my travels are especially dangerous In some places, if someone finds out I'm Israeli, I'd be gone in a minute. You may find it hard to believe, but I am the normal one. You see, I'm covering world conflicts, mainly in countries where Israelis are forbidden to go. I try to bring Israelis, or some of them often succumb to stereotypes that anyone beyond our border is an enemy, a different view of how things really look like from within. Some of my documentaries are broadcast all over the world, and from the very beginning of my career, I realized that only when I'm there, in the field, can I really understand what's happening. In hindsight, when I try to think about it, about my inspiration, it came from a black and white TV show that we all been watching as kids. It's called The Time Tunnel. The idea was two American scientists, Doug and Tony, and they can step into a mysterious tunnel in their lab, and within a few seconds, they will be thrown in time to some point in the past. They could land at the middle of a decisive battle of King David, or they might find themselves in the room of Leonardo da Vinci while he was painting the Mona Lisa. And me, more than being fascinated with traveling in time, I was inspired by the idea that I could be present at the most interesting points in history and to document the most dramatic events of our lifetime. My first opportunity came with a war in Bosnia, and already there I learned the most valuable lesson in my life. What you think of as your disadvantages just might turn to be your big strength. Bosnia. The capital, Sarajevo, was a city under siege. People were being shot at, and I did everything I could in order to get inside and tell their story. I was very excited to know that I'm about to fulfill my journalistic values for the first time, but just as we arrived, we were caught in a sniper fire, and me, I completely lost it. I was terrified. I was trembling. My feet literally couldn't stand it. I fell on the ground. And beside the paralyzing fear, it was that uh, sad realization that, hey, admit it, you ain't got it. You wanted to be a field correspondent, to feel the heartbeat, to go deep, you ain't got it. While on the ground, things became even worse. I saw all around me, soldiers, but also journalists, and everybody was so big and muscular. I remember look at the people, from the ground, telling myself, no, this is a real man, unlike yourself. <laughs> Look at you, skinny boy, on the verge of tears. This is not a place for you. You are laughing now, but I was so sad back then. And I ran away to the nearest hotel, you know, I locked myself inside, and I was convinced I'm not macho enough for this line-off job. But the following day, there was a ceasefire for a few hours, so I did get out. And something interesting happened. People talked to me. I was less interested in guns, grenades, war tactics. I'm interested in people, victims of all sides. And to my surprise, they talked to me more than they talked to the other journalists who I adored. Those who were well-built and looked a bit like warriors themselves. I remember one of my macho colleagues telling me about this horrifying phenomena of women who are being raped in the war. 
But, he added, these women wouldn't talk. It took me a while to figure out why they wouldn't talk to him or his alikes. I mean, think about victims of militia soldiers. Think about women who are being raped. When they encounter the macho-style journalist, even if these journalists are good people, something in their appearance just might remind them of the thugs that attacked them. And that was not the case with me. I mean, you can say a lot of things about me, but no one, nowhere will spot me approaching and will say, oh my God, look who's coming, let's run away. No. <laughs> I'll get a look. No one will run away from me. And this is why they talk to me. And I realize being non-macho, in a macho place, gave me access that other journalists didn't have. And for the first time in my life, I felt like Doug and Tony from the Time Tunnel. I could be present at the most interesting place on earth and tell the story of these people. Now, you see here, that's me working alone. And that's also one of the things that I thought of as a disadvantage of mine back at the time. You know, at the beginning, I envied the big crews, the TV networks, a typical TV crew at a correspondent, cameraman, assistant cameraman, soundman, translator, producer, a bunch of bodyguards, some of them ex-Navy SEALs, well-armed. They look so impressive. Me? I have no budget. I'm a one-man band, and as you can see, no one seemed to be impressed by me. Actually, no one seemed even to relate to me. But after this uh, little blow to the ego, I realized that it just might be a good thing. Because in places like Bosnia, Rwanda at the time, Afghanistan, Iraq, Haiti, Syria, media sometimes can be perceived as a bit intimidating. I mean, think about the locals over there. They know that beside brave soldiers, they are surrounded by quite a sketchy group of people. Thugs, gangs, militias, war criminals, prisoners who were released out of prison because back then they were the only people who had the guts to fight. And with that notion of all these people around you, you will think very carefully before opening your mouth, let alone to the big media. I remember suicide bombing in Iraq, in Baghdad, in the markets. And there was a merchant in the market, and he was approached by a very famous TV crew. They put a camera in his face, lighting, long microphone. Two bodyguards came with machine guns, stood by him, and the correspondent with a flag jacket approached and asked, how are you? And you see this poor merchant on the verge of a heart attack. Why? Because all of a sudden, he became the focus of attention. Everybody in the market looking, what is he going to say? So he just answers, everything is okay, no problem. The correspondent would insist. I mean, there are bodies, injured people scattered all over. Please, no problem, sir, everything is okay, leave me alone. And so the TV crew leaves. But when I approach them, the attitude is different. Not because personally it is me, they don't know me, but because I don't look like the threatening media. People in the market at that point of time think to themselves, well, uh, the serious media is just gone and we are left with uh, this guy? <laughs> in comparison to the big media, I don't look serious and it is okay. Because when I open my camera, they are free to feel at ease. They are open. They are real. This is me while in there. I never become the story. I never stand out. I'm sort of a shadow. Anyway, since Bosnia, I've been to dozens of conflicts all over the world. And I learned not to develop assumptions, not only about myself and my abilities, but mainly about the people I was about to document. Because Every sort of stereotype I had prior to arriving in the place proved to be shallow and superficial when I encountered real life, when I was there. I just want to come open and document everyone, everything. But then a different challenge, new challenge came to my life. 
the biggest, most dramatic events came to my neighborhood, the Middle East. Historical revolutions in Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, wars in Yemen, Iraq, Syria. And you challenge, because as an Israeli, you cannot get to these places, and me, knowing it, I wanted to be there because Israelis, I know, get their information from people who've never been there. So how do I get inside these countries? Well, technically, I have a foreign passport, and I will take care that not a word in Hebrew will appear on my clothes, my equipment, my documents. But the challenge is more mental, I would say. Let me show you what I mean. Look at this photo. I love this photo because I look so cool here, right? <laughs> yeah, with a smile and all. And that's the big deception. Because behind this smile, there is a man who is frightened to death, on the verge of collapse. Very soon into my work, I realized that the most dangerous thing I could do to myself is to look frightened. I mean, I am scared, but you will never see it on the outside. First time I realized it, you know, it was the first time that I crossed inside Syria with all the demons in my head. Oh my God, they would realize who I am. It's the beginning of the end. They will kill me. I was terrified, and so was my expression. I looked like that back then. And this is a horrible expression because as you see, it attracts attention like a magnet. And I know that if someone comes and checks me out, with all due respect to the foreign passport that I have, we live in an age that within seconds, you know, a basic Google or a face recognition, and he will see photos from my bar mitzvah. <laughs> well, I did manage to get away of this one, but the notion was clear from now on. In a situation like that, even if you are very much afraid, don't you dare look like that. Which means, sometimes, I have no choice, I have to do some, some acting. Like in here. Soon after 9-11, I headed to Afghanistan. Afghanistan that was ruled by uh, the Taliban who hosted Al-Qaeda. Afghanistan where the U.S. was about to invade. And on the border between Pakistan and Afghanistan, I hear chants, death to America, death to Israel. I see people burning the Israeli flag and the flag of the United States of America. And I'm actually watching now my two identities in flames. I'm about to freak out, but I will keep it inside. On the outside, I should give the, you know, like the impression that everything is absolutely fine with me. You know, people there, some of them were smoking cigarettes. Now, I'm not a smoker, but if it helps, I'll smoke anything. <laughs> I'm approaching the guy who is burning my flag. Hey, you got to smoke. He looks at me, but since I'm calm, he is calm. He lights my cigarette with the same lighter with which he sets my flag on fire. Inside, I'm terrified as hell. On the outside, that cool smile. I even get closer. I step on the remains of my flag, which by now is completely melted. I am acting as if nothing here has to do with me. And when people are fine with me, conversation begins, and my access will begin, and only then will my journalism begin. In some situation, the people you feel intimidated by, give them the sense that you trust them, that you feel fine, safe, and comfortable by their presence. This is why I also sometimes give the camera, my camera, to, to local. I mean, when you watch me in the picture, I mean, I'm the cameraman, so if I'm in the picture, I give the camera to someone else. And as we mentioned, camera sometimes can be the tool that threatens them. So once I give it away to someone and I ask him, please, can you help me in filming? I give him the sense that I trust him. And I do. I was filmed by Hutus, by Tutsis, by Sunnis, by Shias, by Taliban, by extreme radicals on the right and on the left. And some people, you know, they ask me, 
How can you give them your camera? Even for a few seconds, they might steal it and run away. Oh, really? And had they wanted to steal my camera, you think that me, doesn't man on me that I would be able to prevent it? People ask me, don't you have a bodyguard by your side? No. Don't you carry a gun? God forbid, no. If I will carry a gun, it will lead to a shooting. Well, at least you have some knowledge of karate, martial arts to defend yourself, you know, if needed. What's karate or martial arts? It is me in front of 500 Taliban's. It's not a kung fu movie. <laughs> the logic should be exactly the opposite. Don't look intimidated. Try to get closer. I get people to trust me by trusting them. And by the way, by then, I can tell them that I'm an Israeli when we trust each other. By then, nationality doesn't matter, only what you are as a human being. So, back to the question of what is normal and what is mad. Robert Kappa, probably the greatest war photographer of all times, said, if your photos aren't good enough, you are not close enough. And this is it. And Robert Kappa documented the most dangerous landing in Normandy in World War II. And by the way, it was a normal thing for a journalist to do, being present in the most interesting place on Earth at the most crucial time. This is what people expected from us. No one called us crazy for going there. But unfortunately, things have changed. You know, the media world nowadays, the big networks, this world is dominated by commentators who are speaking in the studios instead of doing field work. Now, don't get me wrong, I mean, some of them are real, intelligent people, but when you think about it, they express themselves eloquently, they have the ties, the jackets, the makeup, knocking on the table, absolutely opinionated about everything, but most of them are talking about places they've never been in and commentating about people they never met. And the way I see it, this is crazy. <laughs> Me? I keep on doing the same fieldwork journalism I've been doing for the past three decades. I remain one of the few normals. It's the world around me, the studio world around me that gone mad. So, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to challenge you today. Be normal like me. When normal is going to where the action is, being present, talking to people, normal is not sitting on the couch, and listening to commentators in the studio. Normal is seeing your disadvantages as strength, and normal is getting people to trust you by trusting them. Thank you very much.